talk to you this morning about the Christmas villains. You're probably familiar with uh, Matthew chapter number 2, but we'll start with Scripture there. Verses 1 through 8. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, Now Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. So a confession to make. Whenever I'm preaching about Christmas, there's always a little bit of hesitancy, because the idea is, I've studied this story my entire life, and I know many of you have probably heard this story since you were very young. And it's easy to just glance over the glory, the beauty of the Christmas story, and just kind of space out and start thinking about what's going to happen on Monday. So as I've been studying this, and I was, I was studying a particular part of the Christmas story, God laid this on my heart. And so we know that all great stories have a villain, right? And I would argue that all great stories have a great villain. And I don't mean as in morally great, but cunning, hard to beat, right? Think of, of these characters. Like who's Batman without Joker? You know, who are the Avengers without Thanos, who could snap his fingers and half the universe disappears? Who's Wonder Woman without the Nazis? Going back a little bit, who is Luke Skywalker without Darth Vader? Who are Frodo and King Aragorn without Saruman? Who's Aslan without the White Queen? And then, you know, who, what is the University of Kentucky without the University of Louisville? I'm just joking, okay? <laughs> I probably lost, I'm just making sure you're listening. <laughs> probably lost a few Christmas cards, or vice versa, all right? And so a great story, it needs a supervillain, right? Well, the story of the creation, fall, redemption through Christ's birth and his resurrection, his return to end evil and rule and reign forever, it has these supervillains hardwired into it. And truly the Christmas story, the greatest story ever told, has some great villains, and so this, this week, I wanted to focus in on those villains, learn a little bit, even counterintuitively, how they point to Jesus. Now, when we think of Christmas, we certainly have, the, what's the nemesis? The nemesis is the Grinch, right? That's always trying to steal Christmas. But of course, in the biblical account of Christmas, Christ's birth, we have Herod. Herod here in the story that we just read is so concerned about his throne and we know that later on in that same passage, he kills all of the young males in Bethlehem just to be sure this ancient prophecy doesn't take place. Earlier this year, as I was researching for my, my latest book, I was studying government at the time of Christ. I know a lot about American government, but didn't know as much about how government functioned in Christ's day. And I just came across a very simple fact. I had always read scripture, and you're always reading about Herod. Herod, 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 Herod. And it just kind of assumed they were all kind of the same person. I knew the first one died, and then there was a second one. But did you know there's more than one Herod? In fact, there's a lot of them. And I used to joke, or we used to joke when I lived in Arkansas, and no offense to the, the beautiful natural state, there's a lot of great people there, still a family there. We used to joke that every male at a hillbilly family reunion was named the same thing. Like, hi, my name's Jim Bob. <laughs> Here's my nephew, his name's Jim Bob. And then there's my uncle. His name, Jim Bob. All right. And so it's like throughout scripture, every time you hit a king, his name's Herod. But there's actually a number of different Herods. And so today I want to show you this royal family that was royally messed up. Okay. <laughs> and I'll explain um, how they were royally messed up. And so uh, we're going to put the family tree up on this screen as well. And so you can get lost in all the details. I'm going to ask you to focus on four different Herods. And I told you, there's a lot of them. All right, so the first one, just kind of in review, and then I'm going to go through them. The first one is Herod the Great. And we know Herod the Great from the passage that we just read. But then there is Herod Antipas, which is down here, who is Herod's son. And then there is Herod's grandson, Herod Agrippa I. Uh, Herod Antipas, we know as the Herod that killed John the Baptist 
who dressed Jesus up in a mock robe and sent him back to Pilate. Herod Agrippa I is the Herod that kills James and arrests Peter and is eventually eaten of worms. And then Herod Agrippa II is the Agrippa that we know that was almost persuaded to follow Jesus. So just a little bit as, you, as we're trying to understand what um, Herod did, we're going to leave this up um, and pull it back up from time to time. And you can follow up here with a couple of additional visuals. This is Herod's palace. It was also a fortress. And uh, just within the last week or two, archaeologists have opened up his personal theater. All right? And so this was Herod's kind of like normal palace where he did business. It was also a fortress. It's on this dome-shaped hill. And you can see pictures of it. It's just massive. But he also had a winter palace. And then he also had an oceanside palace. And he built cities. He's known as this master builder. He even refurbished the temple. He built Masada, the famous fortress where the Jews would later stand against the Romans. And so he was known as a builder. But his his tendency to get jealous about his throne is well known in history. All right, so you're going to see that he had a number of wives. This isn't even all of his wives from what I understand. Um, But he killed the children in Bethlehem, right? Well, this wasn't the only people that he killed that were, it's just, wow, you did that? Um, Including Antipater, a son, including Miriam, his wife, his sons, Alexander and Aristobulus. He killed all of them. He executed them. So he was jealous about his throne. So let's jump into some of the lessons, now that you have a little bit of a primer, on what was going on in Palestine. Number one, we'll talk about the monarch in the manger. The monarch in the manger. Of course, in Matthew chapter number two, you have the wise men coming to Herod saying, we've we've seen his star in the east. We have this prophecy that links back to Daniel. We know how many years it was going to be until the time of the Messiah. And so we're here and the stars led us here. And of course, Herod is afraid. Why? Because his throne is threatened. His power is threatened. He wants to know where Jesus is, not so he can go worship him, but so that he can Do away with him. And we know that, of course, he wasn't able to find him, so he ends up killing all of the children in Bethlehem. But, and I won't go back to the Old Testament to show you, but Herod's religious advisors, when they're telling Herod about where the baby was going to be born, they miss out, they leave out a really key part of the verse, which says that he's of everlasting and from of old. You see, Herod was afraid, but he should have been terrified. He was concerned for his throne, but he should have been concerned for his soul. Because this baby that was being born, though it was God come to be with us, and we like that part of it, but this was not an abdication of Christ's authority. This was a coronation in a cradle. And the wise men from the east emphasized that by bringing regal gifts to Jesus. And so the lesson that we have from Herod the Great is that here's a monarch in the manger, and he was afraid for his throne, but it was so much bigger than even what he understood at the time. Secondly, we'll talk about the fox and the lion. And to explain that, I need to show you this map. Like Alexander the Great, when Alexander the Great died, his, his rule, his kingdom was split up into different pieces. This was true of Herod the Great as well. And his three sons basically took over his empire. Philip took kind of the northern part here. Uh, But for our discussions, the the two important pieces are that Herod Archelaus took Samaria and Judah, and Herod Antipas took Galilee and Perea. And importantly, Nazareth Nazareth is in Galilee. Now, after a few years, Herod Archelaus, uh, I guess he was kind of a chip off the old block, and he's killing people, he's crazy. And so Rome replaces him and takes over this part of Palestine and just makes it a straight-up Roman province. It was taken over by a prefect, you probably know his name, Pontius Pilate. All right, so it's, sometimes when I'm reading the scripture, I'm like, well, why is there Pilate, and then why is there King Herod? It's because Pontius Pilate was responsible for this area, but Herod Antipas was a client king of Rome. Rome allowed him to keep the title, like, oh, that's cute, as long as you control the people. And so Herod Antipas controlled Galilee and Perea. So whenever Jesus is ministering in the northern parts of Israel, he runs into Herod Antipas. Now, I told you that this family was messed up. 
and that it was royally messed up. Here's why, all right? You remember John the Baptist lost his head. He was killed. Well, why? Because he told Herod that he couldn't have his brother's wife. All right, here's what happens. So here's Philip. Philip marries Herodias, who's not only now his wife, she's also his niece. All right, so he marries his niece. And then Herod Antipas, I guess he took a liking to Herodias. And so he takes Herodias from Philip. So why is John the Baptist all upset about this? I mean, it's bad enough that he's in the middle of adultery. But he not only marries his brother's wife, he also marries his niece. And so John the Baptist is like, uh, that's not okay. <laughs> and most of the Jews, that would also not be okay with them. And so this greatly strained the relationship between Herod Antipas and the Jews, and also loses John the Baptist's head, because Herodias didn't like it. We come to Luke chapter number 13 and verse 31. That's kind of in the background. The same day, there came certain of the Pharisees, Luke 13, 31 through 33, there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out and depart thence, hence for Herod will kill thee. Herod will kill you. And this is Jesus saying unto them. He said unto them, Go ye, go you, and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. So Jesus calls Herod a fox. And sometimes people say, Jesus had nothing to say about government. Well, he calls Herod, again, the ruler of Galilee and Perea, a fox. And so this one, I, I will say the fox and the lion. All right, so we're studying Herod Antipas, the fox and the lion. So this statement, Jesus called Herod a fox, fascinates me. Why? Because when we think of a fox, we think of a cunning animal, right? We have briar fox, briar rabbit, so our context is that a fox is kind of sly, the fox in the hen house, right? But in Jewish culture, there was a deeper meaning, which I just love, all right? And it's this. Remember Matthew 8, 20? Jesus noted that foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but he did not have a home in the traditional sense. So foxes in Jewish culture were considered cunning, crafty animals, but they were also considered small and insignificant. There was a statement in Jewish society, there are lions before you, and you ask foxes. And so when Jesus was calling Herod a fox, he wasn't just commenting on his craftiness. He was communicating something along these lines. You, Herod, are neither honorable nor great. You claim to be a lion, but you are a fox. You are powerless and insignificant, and you do not know whom you threaten. So don't, don't miss this moment. All right, I, I love this. In this exchange, the fox met the lion. This petty client king of Rome dared to threaten the life and purpose of the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Jesus told him in no uncertain terms who he was and that he could not touch or control him. With one word, fox, Jesus said all of that. And so only the word could say that in a word. So the fox and the lion we know that eventually Herod Antipas was banished to Gaul, which was kind of like the furthest reaches away from the Roman court, because a family member, Herod Agrippa I, who we're about to talk about, said something bad about Herod Antipas, and Herod Antipas gets the boot by the emperor Caligula. And so that's how Antipas passes out of history. So the fox and the lion. Number three, We'll talk about at terms with the worms. And so we've talked about Herod the Great up here. We've talked about Herod Antipas, who married Herodias, now passes out of history, being sent to Gaul. And now Herod Agrippa I takes his place. Turn with me to Acts chapter number 12, 20 through 24, is where we pick up this story. Now, Herod Agrippa I knew Emperor Tiberius personally. And that's something that, understand, when you're looking at power dynamics... Jesus, by all apparent, you know, all appearances, is an impoverished carpenter from this little city called Nazareth. And the Herods, they're client kings of Rome. They have personal relationships with Julius Caesar, with Caligula, with Nero. They build these massive palaces. 
They have all of this wealth and splendor and power in comparison to the lowly disciples of Jesus. And because Herod Agrippa I wanted to please the Jews, he has James executed. Oh, it'll make people happy. Well, off with his head. Or he arrests Peter with the same intention. You remember that it, the angels let Peter out, and but for that, Peter probably would have died at the hands of Herod Agrippa I. And so join me there, Acts 12, 20 through 24. You probably know the story. And Herod was highly displeased when them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. So he's dressed up like a king, and he starts talking. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now look at, the, no, that's okay, yeah, um, yikes. Um, and then look at the next verse. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Now, whenever I've read that passage, I've always kind of had this like Hollywood view of like he's standing there and the people think he's a God. And then all of a sudden, like worms just like come out of his skin. I'm sorry, we're going to go to lunch a little bit. And like he's eaten and he just kind of disappears right there. Right? It, probably what happened is that he passed out while he was speaking and then he died from parasites in his stomach, which is probably worse than the whole dying on camera type thing. I don't know. But he, he dies. And God tells us exactly why he dies. Because he basically made himself like God. And then I love the contrast in this passage. All right, so here's Herod Agrippa I that knows the emperor of Rome that swindled his way into power. And because of his pride, God takes him out. And yet what keeps growing, what keeps moving forward it's the kingdom of God. It's the church. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And so that's at, term with the worm, at terms with the worms. Next, let's talk a little bit about the gospel to the great. And so we mentioned Herod the Great. We've talked about Herod Antipas, Herod Agrippa I, and now we'll talk about Herod Agrippa II. Now, you can tell I'm moving very quickly through these passages. There's a lot more to study here. I encourage you to study it out in your own quiet time. But I'm trying to give you the highlights in the time that we have together this morning. So when Herod Agrippa I passed away, Herod Agrippa II was only 17. And because of that, Rome's like, well, you're a little too young to control this entire kingdom. And so they, in a sense, took back control of that area. But Herod Agrippa II was ambitious. And so he goes to Rome. He becomes personal friends of Nero. You probably remember the name of that Roman emperor who ends up killing Christians, etc. And so he begins to, to get in the good graces of Nero and is put back into power. By the time that we catch up with Agrippa, we're in Acts chapter number 25, verse 13, then we'll be in Acts chapter number 26. What's going on with the church is that Paul, the apostle Paul, is in Roman chains. All right, he's been arrested by the Roman state, and very similar to the trial of Jesus, Rome is almost, you know, they're trying to keep control. And because of that, they're kind of an unwilling participant in the story. And you can see it with Pontius Pilate. He, he says to the Jews, I don't, I think he's innocent. I think he's fine. And then the Jews are like, I'll crucify him. And then he has him flogged just to make him happy. And so all the time they're trying to keep power. And the same is true with Paul. Okay, so you believe in one God. You believe in Jehovah. Rome was a, a pluralistic society that, that believed in many gods. As long as you obeyed the emperor and gave heed to the fact that he was deity as well, then there really wasn't too much trouble. But Paul's preaching the gospel, that the only way to salvation is through Jesus Christ. And this gets him in trouble with the Jews. Now he's been in prison in Roman custody for a number of years. And in Acts chapter number 25, verse 13, it says, And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. All right, so... Um, history, I told you that this story is, this family, this royal family is royally messed up. I'll give you just one more element since the kids are with us this morning. Herod Agrippa II had a romantic interest with Bernice, who's mentioned in this passage, who was also his sister, but 
Okay, so the, just, I told you, this family's royally messed up. Um, and so this is uh, King Agrippa. He comes to Caesarea to salute Festus. Festus is the Roman ruler who would have been in the same position as Pontius Pilate. All right, so remember, you have kind of the client king of Rome in the north, you have the Roman province in the south. And so Agrippa comes down, he wants to say hi to Festus. Now move with me to Acts 26, 1 through 2. It says, and after uh, certain days, King Agrippa, uh, I'm sorry, then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered uh, for himself. Verse number two, and he's in chains. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. So here's, here's the moment. All right, so he's on trial. Paul is on trial. He's finally given him, given an opportunity to preach for himself, to speak for himself, defend himself. And he's there in front of a Roman official named Festus, and then Agrippa. I find it really interesting in this passage, Paul doesn't address Festus. Festus says something to Paul later on and calls him mad. Um, He addresses this entire sermon to Agrippa. Again, he says, I think myself happy because I shall answer for myself this day. Verse 6, it says, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Remember, Paul was formerly Saul, and Saul had killed Christians, thrown them in jail. Now he's converted, and throughout chapter number 26, you can read it separately, he gives his testimony of conversion to Christianity, and then his work in promoting the gospel throughout the Roman world. And he comes down to verse number 27. I love, Paul gives this entire story, and here's the focus question. He looks at King Agrippa, and he says, Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. This was a question. King Agrippa, do you want to be saved? Do you want to know? Do you want to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Verse 28, then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with him. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doth nothing worthy of death or bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. There are, there are times when I study Scripture, and I love reading the Bible because it has just endless depth. And if you've been in a relationship with Jesus for a time, you, you found that out. You, you read a passage and something new that you're going through, it just speaks to your heart. When I was studying this passage, something similar happened. And I've read this a lot, and I'd always just kind of chalked up Agrippa as this kind of one-off ruler in the, in the space, and um, you know, Paul's talking to him, and he's trying to lead him to Christ. But with this in mind, this is, this is so much richer. Why? On both accounts. Here's Herod Agrippa the second. Herod knows everything I've just told you. He's the great-grandson of the Herod the Great that tried to kill baby Jesus. He's the grandson of Herod Antipas who put John the Baptist to death and and dressed Jesus in a mock robe and sent him to die. And, And he's the son of the Herod who thought he was God and died eaten of worms. So when Paul speaks to Agrippa, This is not without context. He knows the story of Jesus. He has a close family connection to this entire narrative. And then there's Paul. (laughs) I admit to you that if I was Paul and I had a chance to talk to Agrippa, (laughs) it would have been a different speech. Huh, you think you're so strong and powerful and mighty? Well, what happened to your grandfather? He ends up killing his own family, in a sense goes mad and dies. We think of Herod Antipas, who thought he was big stuff and wanted to threaten the life and ministry of Jesus, the King of Kings, and ends up deposed by his own family member. And then, I know this is tough, Herod, but let's talk about your dad, who thought he was God and died of parasites. And so who do you think you are? You you think you're going to stop 
the course of the gospel? You think you're going to stop the church? But that would be me and my flesh. Like I said, when there's endless depth in Scripture, what, what is the truth that just blew me away? Agrippa knows everything I just shared with you. And so does Paul. But what does Paul do? Does he stand up and give a diatribe about Roman government? Does he accuse Herod Agrippa II of all of these sins of the past? What does he do? He invites him into a relationship with Jesus. That's why number four, I just say, the gospel to the great. The gospel to the great. And one of the reasons I'm a Christian is just how counterintuitive that is. It flips everything on its head. Here you have power, might, personal relationships with the emperors of Rome, massive palaces, mighty armies. And here, a carpenter from Nazareth, a bunch of fishermen, a washed-up Pharisee that turned the world upside down. And so Paul takes the gospel to the great. So I've talked about the Christmas villains this morning. The Christmas villains. And, and we know of that, that old hymn. We actually we sang it today, a beautiful hymn. Hark the heralds, angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. You probably know this phrase, right? And so I always try to play on words a bit and try to help you remember kind of what we talked about. And so from this angle, all right, so every great story has a great villain. Well, the Christmas story has some great villains. And it's the Herods. And so from this element, it points us to the same truth. But looking at it just slightly differently, we could say, hark, listen up. The Herod's anger brings glory to the one true king. There's one more lesson from all of this, though. And I will admit to you that this truth makes me very uncomfortable. Really, really uncomfortable as an American Christian. And I'm pretty sure it's going to make you uncomfortable as well. So when I show this to you, please give me the benefit of the doubt and let me explain. Because as I've thought about the Christmas, Christmas story, there's certainly the Grinch, and then there's Herod the Great as the villain. But if I stop and really drill down into the Christmas narrative, when Jesus, God himself, was born in a manger and was wrapped in swaddling clothes, the clothes reserved for treating the dead, what did it mean? It means that the cradle points straight to the cross. That Jesus had to come and die for our sins so that we could have eternal life. And so why was Jesus born in a cradle? Yes, I'm glad that he's Emmanuel. I'm, I'm glad that that brings us peace and that brings us joy. But why did God have to come, be born as a baby, take the, the form of a human, and die? It's because of my sin. And so when I think of villains, the Christmas villains. If I'm really honest with myself, I'd love to point out the Herods and all the strange, really royally messed up family they had. But if I'm honest with myself, we are the Christmas villains. And as I've prayed about what's the message of Christmas that I need, that I think perhaps we need in 2020, I actually think it's this. As hard as it is for us to hear, and why? Because the, the American, like Hallmark, Norman Rockwell version of American Christmas, where there's warmth and hot cocoa and family and, and joy and you got a good job and everything's good to go, that, that's great. But it's never been enough. And 2020 highlights that in an especially painful way. But some of you may, may experience, well, that the family element of that, it's broken, and something's really messed up in this space. Or I've lost a job, or I'm full of anxiety and worry, and I, I don't know what's going to happen in our country. And so it's really hard to sit there around the Christmas tree and just, oh, this American dream, this American version of Christmas is so great when, well, it doesn't line up to reality. And that's why the biblical version of Christmas is so much better. It's that regardless of who I am, regardless of my sin, that Christ came and died anyway. And let's review the Herods. Herod the Great, what was his problem? His problem was, I like my throne. I alone am on the throne. And Jesus, 
and family members, you can't have it. And if you try, I'll knock off your head. Right? But certainly we haven't resorted to violence. But when I'm thinking about I alone am on the throne, that I want to control my life, I mean, isn't that me as well? That I wake up with days when Jesus says something like, oh, pick up your cross, die to yourself and follow me. Oh, that, you know, I don't know if that goes along with American culture. I don't know if that makes me real comfortable today because I want to be on the throne of my life. What about Herod Antipas? His was all about, Jesus, I want you to do a miracle. And if you don't do a miracle, well, <laughs> then what good are you? Because I know best how to run the kingdom. And if we're honest, isn't that us as well? That we think we know better how to build God's kingdom for him? And we want to do our own thing? And when God tries to tell us, no, you should do it this way, we kind of kick against it. And then what about Herod Agrippa I? Who, man, I like it when people say I'm like a God. And his problem was pride. Look at me. Look at all that I've accomplished. Well, that's not just a problem that kings have. That's a problem that we have. And then lastly, Herod Agrippa II. Whether it's the truth of salvation constantly that's been just beating at the door of your heart, or it's God's truth about that, that sin that's just kind of hardwired in there and that you can't root out of your life, whether it's worry or anxiety or lust or greed or anger or whatever it is, and God keeps telling you it's time to get rid of it, like, oh, uh, maybe tomorrow. You, know, may, may, you almost got me this time, but maybe next time. And so we like to think about the villainy of the Herods. But if we're honest with ourselves, we fall short of God's grace and God's mercy. We have sinned. We have broken God's covenant. We read about this in Isaiah. Jesus took upon himself the iniquity of us all. And yes, he came on that not-so-silent night in the manger. And that's cute. And it brings joy and peace to the world. But he came to die. The cradle led to the cross. And so this Christmas, we, we not forget that we are truly the Christmas villains. And, and why does that make Christmas special? Because regardless of how things are going with the family, or how things are going at work, or how things are going in the country or the world, regardless of everything seems normal, Jesus still died for me, a sinner. And he came so that I could have eternal life. And so when my family gathers together on Christmas morning, everything else can be out of order. Everything else can seem to be falling apart. But it is this truth that helps us have joy and peace at Christmas time. We are the Christmas villains.